Oh, what is good, everybody? We are back from the land of the living. Welcome to episode 33 of the THP Strength Podcast. I know it's been a long time since we haven't done a podcast, but we're here live. And guess what? Me and John are here in the flesh together. It's not it's not over Skype or FaceTime. It is John, say something. Look, listen oh, to yeah, how yeah. clear gonna, John sounds. Listen to how crispy this audio is. It's oh, first, baby. <laughs> first time for everything. And look, I can even interrupt John and it's not going to cut out the audio. <laughs> yeah, it's which crazy. Is, it's just hilarious, actually. So the audio is going to be crispy for those of you listening, uh, which is going to be going to be good for, for listeners and then viewers. We also are together. So the, the, audio, the video will also be better, too, because we're not uh, screen recording unless we we need to find a way if we want to have someone Skype in with us. We're thinking we put it on the TV, but we don't have a good setup yet. My room's not big enough, so. It's weird. I don't know if I should be talking to the camera or to you. Or like, <laughs> Probably. Hey. Yeah, that is weird. I guess if we sit like this. We'll be talking like, to both. Like, yeah, like both. Like, kind of both. Yeah. I feel like it's easier if you look at the camera. Because then, like, you're not distracted by each other. I don't know. We don't, we don't have to talk. We're going to figure this out. <laughs> this is our first time trying it in person, so we'll see. But, um, yeah, so. I guess the, the first thing we could probably talk about is what has been happening over the last week and a half. So yeah. for those of you that don't know, Isaiah um, came to visit. He had been self-quarantined for two-ish weeks. And no, two-ish months. Two-ish, two-ish months. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it had been yeah. two weeks. And basically, we were trying to figure out, before this happened, we were trying to figure out how we wanted to try out us living closer together to see would our productivity go up? Would we have better content? Would we be able to do more with um you know thp strength and stuff like that would the podcast be better so this is the trial phase for that his training all those things and yeah i don't know generally i'd say it's gone really really well (laughs) also a big motivator is that john has a squat rack and bumper plates that's he just uses me for my stuff (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's it's been really nice uh training here and i would say it's, it's going pretty well this is the hardest i've trained in my life yeah um also, I apologize for not recording podcasts. We said we were going to do it on Tuesday, Thursdays. But mind you, this was our first week of training. And we were so fatigued that like we didn't feel like doing anything on the Tuesdays and Thursdays. Which is such a perfect intro to <laughs> what we're talking about. So we're going we're gonna to talk about intent and how intent can impact really everything that you do. And when I say everything you do, I mean everything you do. From your brain to your muscles to, to really like how you're going to recover anything else. So um, I have to shut that noise off. It's gonna, sorry for those of you on WhatsApp sending us messages right now. I muted my computer. Uh, (laughs) It's like PTSD in my mind. No, I'm kidding, we're getting better at that too. But uh, we wanna talk about intent because it it really, it's changed like simple things. It's it's made walking upstairs and not bumping into things difficult. It's made finding words difficult, our mood. what our patience levels are like, stuff like that. And I think like a lot of people don't, we don't even really understand CNS fatigue. So when you're talking about, okay, well, how does intent play into this? CNS fatigue is what happens when you train super, super hard in really anything. We, we see people used to think it was just uh, sprint training or weight room or things that really are explosive in nature because there's just so much drive that has to come from your brain to, um, to recruit those muscles so you can do whatever it is you're trying to do. But we're actually seeing that just anytime you train hard. So whether you're like a distance runner or you are, uh, you could be a basketball player, you could be a soccer player. And if you're just on the field all the time, running, doing activity, whatever it is, you actually can even be potentially more uh, CNS fatigued or fatigued from those activities as well. So it's not just sprint training or explosive training. That's kind of a misconception. Question. Yes, do you I think, think do you think playing video games can cause CNS fatigue? Right, Take two. All right, we gotta. I'll have to clip splice these together. Isaiah, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, um, <laughs> that was so funny. Uh, for for those of you listening, John uh, was getting called by his brother, and <laughs> yeah, I answered it to tell him stop calling me. <laughs> That's amazing. I knew I should have done that. Too. Um, so so I I asked if playing video games cause CNS fatigue because I was actually noticing. Um, and I, if you guys don't know, I haven't been playing video games for about a month. Uh, when I came back, John owns a PS4, so I've been playing a little more with John. Whoops. <laughs> um, and I've actually noticed uh, times when, like, we play for a while. Afterwards, I'm almost kind of, like, drained a little, like, mentally. Yeah. Like, 
like I, I don't have like as many like emotions i guess is the best way like i just feel kind of like like empty like emotionally yeah um so uh, yeah i'm just curious like do you think it plays a role like like can video games cause cns fatigue so like if you if you just ask yourself i mean there's is there research on this i don't know i honestly don't know but generally based on the research that i do know and kind of what i know about cns fatigue i would assume yes it can so basically your central nervous system is your brain and your spinal cord and your brain and your spinal cord then kind of like peripherate maybe is the best word uh, out of that or periphery. I don't know what the correct word is, but then you have your peripheral nervous system. So your peripheral nervous system would be all of the branching off of your, your spinal cord, you know, into the muscles. And that really does, your brain impacts all of, you know, everything in your peripheral nervous system is impacted by your central nervous system. Yeah and your peripheral nervous system actually feeds back to your central nervous system. So if you have localized fatigue, your brain is gonna sense that, whether it's you know something that is just happening and you don't really notice, it's not voluntary, or maybe it is something that you're noticing with your eyes that you're taking in, or you're choosing to do something and pushing harder on a squat, that's voluntary. Your brain ultimately is controlling and sensing everything that's happening in your body. So CNS fatigue can happen not just by uh, not just by training. CNS fatigue can happen because it's, it's systemic. You know, it could happen from schoolwork. It could happen from stress with your girlfriend. It could happen from uh, being sick. It could happen from people in your life being uh, sick or something like that. Too much so, sex. Too much sex. Uh, <laughs> CNS and, and how you perceive things too. Your perception has a huge uh, role in how you recover because it's, it's psychosomatic, meaning your brain can impact things in your body. That's why meditating can be very effective. That's why, um, you know, not, if, if you believe that premarital sex is wrong and you have premarital sex, well, your recovery is gonna be worse. We see that in research. Because of the stress? Yeah, because it stresses you out. So if you're if you're stressed, then like globally stressed, you're gonna have more CNS. Fatigue. So I guess when it comes to the video it's perception games- too. Perception's a big part. Oh yeah. So I guess with, with video games, I guess it can play a big role depending on how seriously you're yeah, taking exactly. the video game. Because like, if you're going, I'm, I'm super competitive. So if I'm there and I'm maybe having a bad like gaming day, then it might it's affect my mood. Out. It's going to exactly. stress me out. And then when I'm done, like that, just drain my CNS because of the stress and all well, that yeah, stuff. Yeah, and the focus is a lot to do with it too. Like it's the same reason why studying a lot could be really fatiguing for you. Like if you're if you're doing, uh, like if you're quick scoping, we've been practicing quick scoping a lot. Quick scoping is going to fatigue the shit out of you because you're focusing on a little white dot and you're, you're turning corners at a very high sensitivity on the controller. So your brain is, you're, you're visually processing things yeah. and reacting to a stimulus extremely quickly. And like, then compare that to like, if you were to play like Minecraft or something like oh that. Oh yeah, like it's Minecraft, like, relaxed, is like, like my, it's mindless, you know? Like yeah. it's just really not that stressful unless like, you know, someone comes in and destroys your house and then you spent like thousands Freaking of hours creepers. on your house. Exactly, like then you're gonna be pissed off and that's gonna be really stressful. But like, you could play Call of Duty where you just like, lay down with an LMG with a thermal and yeah, I mean, that's not gonna, bags. yeah, and be a D-bag or like sit in this corner with a shotgun and just wait there. Well, that's really not that fatiguing because- like, You guys are starting to realize how nerdy we are. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, all of those, the reason why it's important is because each of those is gonna have, uh, in my opinion, they're gonna be different levels of stress. Like yeah. you typically can subjectively sense how like, how fatiguing something is. Like, how do you feel afterwards? How do you feel during it? You know, what is your, do you notice your heart rate is elevated afterwards? Do you have chest tightness? Those are signs of like stress, you know, being stressed, like anxiety basically. So if you wanted to build the ideal living situation for, for an athlete, like let's say you wanted to make every, <laughs> Like you wanted to hypothetical. <laughs> like you wanted to you wanted to maximize every possible variable for max performance. Would they be in a house like 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 getting a massage every day while listening to relaxing music? It would be like, it would be whatever makes you happiest. That would honestly be what it is. It would be things that make you happy that don't have a very high physiological cost. So like if you lived with your girlfriend and your girlfriend loves you and supports you, and actually a great example of this is Matt Frazier. Matt Frazier, it seemingly has a very, very ideal living situation that allows him to recover very effectively. That reminds me, I gotta watch that next You definitely- I'm doing that right after the podcast. You gotta watch the CrossFit documentary because it, it does, it has good training info. Um, so basically if you, like, so if you're, 
Like Matt Frazier, this is, a, this is a great example. Matt Frazier lives with his girlfriend. You want to explain who Matt Frazier is? Oh yeah, Matt Frazier is a CrossFitter. He's one of the best CrossFitters in the entire world. Like he's incredible. He's actually maybe the best CrossFitter ever. He actually went to the grad school that I went to for a year, dated one of the coaches there, um, or one of the athletes there that then opened a gym in the area. And my buddy Chase that was in the podcast yesterday, uh, he Maybe. actually worked for Vanessa who dated Matt. So anyways, that's how it's all kind of uh, tied together. So I used to work at an OTC or volunteer at Olympic training site, learned a lot from that experience, talked to Vance Newgard, great coach, one of the best coaches I've ever met actually. Um, so yeah, Matt uh, went on after Olympic weightlifting to do CrossFit and ended up becoming the best. So now he dates a girl named Sammy. Sammy basically, um, she makes all his food she uh, makes sure that he's prepped for all those things. He doesn't have to worry about that at all. She doesn't add any stress to him. Like she's not gonna do things that piss him off. Like she's very, it seems like she's very careful about like what she says and she's very supportive of him and understands that he has to decrease global systemic stress. So she's doing everything she can to facilitate that role. Matt is probably also getting massages when he needs them. He trains in an environment that is generally very low stress. He doesn't have people competing with him. He, he competes when he needs to, and he pushes when he needs to, but he's not, he's not doing that all the time, seemingly. You know, he's kind of picking and choosing when he wants to do that. Uh, so it's really managing, like if you're talking about, you want to maximize, you know, the perfect situation, it would be managing systemic stress. So you need to do things that ultimately are going to make you very happy. Well, you might say, well, John, drinking makes me happy. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, smoking weed makes me happy and smoking cigarettes makes me happy and driving fast makes me happy. Well, playing Call of Duty makes me happy. Okay, well, each of those has a cost to them. They're not physiologically free, you know, like there's, if you smoke, th that is a stress to your body. Your body has to respond to that stress. If you drink alcohol the same way, your, your brain, your neurotransmitters in your brain, the chemicals in your brain, they have to bounce back from that stress on the body. Um, you know, if you don't sleep at night because you're up all night freaking having sex, like that's a cost to your body. So while yes, sex can be very, you know, relaxing and relieving to your body, if you're doing it at the cost of not getting sleep, now it's a stress. So it's not this simplistic thing where it's just, this is good, this is bad. You kind of have to look at all these variables and decide, is this really good for me? Is this not good for me? Ask yourself, you know, do I have chest tightness? Do, is my heart rate chronically elevated? Or is my heart pounding when it's not supposed to be when I lay down at night? Um, you know, are you, are you stressed out because this girl keeps arguing with you? Are you, I don't know, are you worried about moving? Are you like all those things? You want to minimize those stresses as much as possible and have the only stress in your life be your training. If you can make the only stress on your body, your training, then you can push harder in that specific stress and your body will be more adaptive. You're going to have more adaptive reserve because you're recovering just so effectively. And sometimes people will ask me, well, how can I recover better? have less stress on your body <laughs> like, I, would, I would say that's more important than any foam rolling or icing that you can ever do because i remember when i was in school and i had a job where i was on my feet all day yeah. and there was like like personal issues maybe that i was dealing with at the time and stuff like that like all that stuff caused me to not be able to recover as well and then not train as efficiently versus and i was like 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 it doesn't matter how much foam rolling stretching and all that stuff i did in those days that's all the stresses that I had externally were it basically like negates anything that you can do yeah. in a positive way versus now like it's just well like what's the only stress like writing training yeah. like, and, like I mean, now, and, and we manage that as best possible like we've yeah. been learning how to do that better and better and better so that it minimizes stress on our lives so that he can recover better while he's while he's training for for dunk league and that you know, I still have goals and I'm still training for those goals. And so I can recover as best possible. And you're happier. You're generally happier doing those things. I think, you know, even just him, Isaiah moving to North Carolina for a month or training with me for this month, there's a learning curve to that. We have to learn, okay, how do we interact optimally? How does he get into a routine where he's happiest? And, you know, like humans are, are they want routine, you know, like we like an agenda. We <laughs> like, what's the, what's the, there's a saying for this. Like I always suck with sayings. I always forget. You know what I mean? It's like humans are uh, beasts of habit or something like that. Uh, creatures of habit. Creatures of habit. There we go. So yeah. <laughs> I suck at those. <laughs> if the bar ain't bending, you're a bitch. <laughs> That's what we said the other day. If you know, you know, check yeah. out my YouTube you know, you channel. Know. Check out my so, YouTube channel. so yeah, I think like there's a learning curve with any of those things. And like, as we get better in understanding each other and understanding how we work best together and understanding how we train best together, like 
we're going to be able to recover better. We're going to be happier and, and we're going to try to optimize that as much as possible for our everyday life. Cause we're happier with it. Like Isaiah doesn't dunk if he's not happy. Like he's, or like he, he wouldn't dunk if it didn't make him happy. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I don't think, I think that's true for me too. Like I wouldn't. That's a, go. that's a stress in of its, honestly, I, I would say that's my biggest stress right now is not being able to dunk. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like, I know, I know you're not. I feel like that is causing me the most like. <laughs> yeah. He probably has the most anxiety from not being able to get sessions in. And that's like a real thing. And it, yeah. it really does come down to, uh, you want to talk about CNS fatigue. It comes down per, to perception too. Like we know that certain things have a physiological cost. Like it is a stress on the body. But when you get to these kind of like soft science issues, like not soft science in the sense that it's not scientific, but it's much harder to measure, um, you know, scientifically looking at biochemically what's happening to neurotransmitters. And is that the only thing that's impacting the overall, overall outcome? You know, something like your brain, that's a, that's a stretch to say that one, you know, biomarker in the body or one neurotransmitter is the res is the result of your entire mood. That that's very hard to do. You might have a hundred different chemicals in your brain, or a thousand, or a million, or some that we don't even know exist yet. That, and and to say that what one is more important than another, that's extremely hard to quantify. You know, when you start putting in all those variables at one time. So, um, yeah. So I think generally, if you're just looking at your mood, how is my mood? How stressed am I? Those are easy questions that really take all of the internal biochemical uh, things that are happening and, and really just gives you an outcome measure that's pretty easy to assess. So I think if you're looking at how's my mood after playing Call of Duty, well, it's really shitty. Okay. Well, you probably shouldn't play Call of Duty so much. <laughs> like, you know, for me, it's a, it's a goal of mine to get better at quick scoping. So I'm going to keep working on that because I like pursuing goals. Um, you know, and it, I don't know, I enjoy it. I'm competitive, same as Isaiah. So for me, maybe it is enjoyable sometimes when it is stressful, I just turn it off. Like I, I honestly just, well, I played like two games today. I started sucking and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So I just turned it off. That's a good strategy to have. You know, if you're playing well and you're having fun and you're enjoying it, then it's probably less of a stress. Um, so back to the perception thing, that's why meditating can be so important every day is yeah. how you perceive the world is going to largely determine how stressed you are and how well you recover. So changing your perception, like for example, let's say, that you like there are people out there there are there are athletes out there that drink every day that smoke weed every day that uh live terrible lifestyles from just an objective point of view of what it does physiologically to your body maybe they have very high living stress uh situations whether their parents are arguing all the time or they maybe a parent isn't there or their, their parents are being whatever they're just not not good parents maybe that's stressful um maybe their their sports coach is an asshole the peers around them are really tough on them like that would be very tough on someone who has maybe not dealt with that their entire life. So, you know, it, it's like what, you know, if I, if I grew up in a situation like I did, I didn't know that the things that were happening to me as a little kid were stressful or, you know, maybe Isaiah had things that happened to him. He didn't know they were stressful at the time. So they didn't really have a physiological cost. There was no cost to it because that was normal. That's what you perceive as normal. That's your baseline, right? So if your baseline is used to more stress, well, now if, someone dies in a car accident and you're used to that happening all the time. Well, that's your baseline. That's not stressful to you at all. You're just chronically used to that. Your body yeah. has adapted to that. Um, it's whenever you add all these new stresses that these say all these traumatic things. And I think trauma affects everyone, but uh, maybe that's a bad example. But I think, just, I think, the, perception. I think that the, being able to change your perspective on what is happening is, is really key because um, a lot of times you can't change like, like the things that happen to your life or the things that, that are affecting you for, like, say like, like having a job, you're almost out of let's say like, like, <laughs> like having, having a job or something like that. Like you can't, you can't change those things or maybe family situations that, that you can't change. Um, but you can work on changing your perspective on those things over time. Yeah. Um, and it's a matter of, let's say, let's say my, my, uh, biggest stress of not being able to not being able to dunk every week. I could see it as, oh yeah, I can't dunk. I'm not, I, I'm not as happy. I can't uh, post my dunks on social media, all that stuff. I could see it as that, or I could see it as, oh, I'm able to train more consistently than I ever have um, yeah. in probably like two years. Like I'm able to train and I'm putting, and I'm, I'm able to make gains long-term and stuff like that. So um, it's easier said than done, but I think like everybody can work on just changing, changing their perspective. Yeah, and it was like, yesterday you said this was really funny. I couldn't believe this came out of your mouth, but you were like, can you imagine if I just trained for two, for a year straight, like didn't even dunk, just trained? And I was like, 
yeah, that would be great. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's very unlikely to happen, but that's a good, like, that's a good comparison, you know, is like, hey, what if, what if, okay, yeah, I can't train right now, but like, or I can't dunk right now, but dude, I'm getting better training than I've ever got in my entire yeah. life, higher quality training. I'm able to push harder in squats. Like, I literally just pushed time. harder in squats this this past week. I think the last time last time I was able to like do squats with with intent like that was like like when I first was training like cuz I I that's one of the first things I heard it was like oh if you want to jump if you want to jump uh higher you got to like do your squats fast like as fast as possible like, you got to push it hard cuz like when you jump you jump hard so you you have to practice like training hard with that intent. Yeah. So I think last time I really did that was when I was like 17 18 then i got hurt met you did a lot of slow strength and all that stuff yeah. so yeah i've been doing squat and this is because of not being it's funny i'm not able to dunk right now so i'm very healthy like with my knees and stuff like that which is allowing me to train with intent mm -hmm. so i'm yeah i'm able to to train harder than i have in years because of the injury so it's like the silver line like seeing the silver lining yeah and so that for being able to perceive things that way ultimately has a positive out impact on your recovery. You know, if you wake up, you're like, damn, I get to get after it today. Like my knees don't hurt. I feel like that's a stress. If your knees hurt, that is stressful. Very One of the stressful. reasons some of you guys come to me is because you're stressed out because your knees hurt and I can fix your knees. Uh, that like, or your Achilles or your hamstring tendon, you know, whatever, like that, I mean, that makes people, uh, happier. That, that makes yeah. them happier. It makes them have less stress in their lives. I so. would say, I would say having having knees that are like fucked up that hurt all the time is more of a stress than not being able to dunk i'm i'm less stressed out right now because i can't dunk right now i'm less stressed out way less stressed out than when i was dunking all the time and my knees were hurting every single day yeah because you feel like your career is going to be over so like there's no longevity to it i, I mean yeah it depends and on it's just it. regular life stuff like yeah you like get up. <laughs> <laughs> i saw the funniest comment on my on my youtube and it was it was a video about knee pain and then everybody it was like everybody uh jumpers knee gang stand up and then like it, he did like a bunch of spaces and yeah. you had to press read more you press read more and it says, but do it slowly. <laughs> that was beautiful. I don't know who said that, but that was brilliant. Yeah. YouTube comments, I'll tell you what, if you have a lot of haters, they suck. But if you have a lot of people that like you, like Isaiah does, they're usually hilarious. Like people are really creative and witty and not like critical. Yeah. <laughs> so it's usually good. It's the um, opposite of Instagram and TikTok, I would say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, TikTok's the worst. But like Instagram, Instagram actually for me, I have a really good following. Like I have a really loyal uh, community of yeah. people that support me so that's i think really it nice, but i think it's based on how uh personable you can be and how much of yourself you can get out to people yeah tiktok <laughs> it's really hard for someone to get to know who someone is on TikTok because most people are posting on tiktok trying to go viral and like and it's like doing, six six seconds or less you put yeah. a catchy song to it like you're never gonna see whereas compare it to a to a youtube video where it's like you're, it's 10 minutes of you being yourself like people you know get to know each other if you if you're and then the the opposite side of the spectrum is real life if you get to know someone in real life how likely are you to be like you fucking prick you can't fucking <laughs> yeah, train right like, like you're not gonna just say that to somebody yeah. so i mean there's a there's like uh there's a couple times where like if someone really just stands for the opposite of what i do i it doesn't matter like if i see that happen over and over again i'm not gonna want anything to do with you um so like i will choose to separate myself but i agree like generally speaking even if you meet someone in person like you might be even able to overcome, you know, what I sometimes struggle with, uh, just because you have a relationship with that person, you're willing yeah. to look past it. Um, I think sometimes that can be difficult in what we do because what other, the, what I would consider to be, um, inappropriate or unethical, uh, are those things are impacting us directly. And yeah. that's where it's really hard because now this person is hurting you online or whatever, not in person, but it, uh, they're doing something that you, they're stooping to a level you wouldn't stoop to because yeah. ethically you're like, well, I wouldn't do that. That's just dirty and wrong. And then they, they do these things and it's like, well, a good example actually impacts you. <laughs> a good example is Dexon. Oh yeah. The, this, is a perfect, this is a perfect example. A good example is, is Dexon. Normally, let's say, let's say like uh, the average person, they're not a dunker. They don't know, a, they don't know about the dunk game. Let's say it's like a basketball player that doesn't get, you know, they're like it's an NBA player or something like that. Yeah. I bet they don't give two shits about the Dexter thing. Like they, they like it doesn't care. affect them whatsoever or anything like that. Let's say someone's keeping up with dunking. That might affect them a little bit. They're like, oh, he's lying, but whatever. 
than let's say you're you're a dunker like that's competing and like that's someone like like Jay Clark where they hit 11 eight dunk. This is a now, perfect analogy. Now it's affecting them a lot because it's uh, giving less credit. It's like discrediting what they it's do. It's discrediting Jay then, Clark because he's shorter and he jumps higher, yeah, quote unquote. Then add something like coaching where you're competing, where it's your business, is how you make a living. That's like, I would say the other side of the spectrum where now it's, you know, it's screwing with literally your life, like your life, exactly. like your income and all that stuff. stuff. Like, and that's what people don't realize is like, why did, why did other coaches get pissed off at other coaches for online coaching or for whatever, things that other I, people would be like, who gives a shit? Cause I would say online coaching beef is some of the worst beef. Like, Oh, it's some of the most personal. Yeah. And, and a lot of the time, like Isaiah didn't understand it. He's like, I don't get why you care until he was coaching and then he was like oh now i and we talked about this the other day yeah uh, we had a few brews and uh we were chatting about it and i was like what changed like why did you understand my point of view and he was like i just started coaching and like started seeing how it was like impacting us like or me i think that's what you said i don't remember actually what your response was but um yeah it was like interesting to see that transition and i mean <clears throat> we give the analogy of like uh we don't advocate drug use but like if you're a drug dealer and like someone's in your territory, you're probably gonna get pretty pissed off. Why? Because it's impacting your the amount of money you're making. Yeah. <laughs> like in the same way in YouTube or uh, and I've never sold drugs, so I don't know that. I'm just saying based off what I've seen in movies. But uh, <laughs> but if you're um, but if you're in YouTube or you're in coaching or whatever else, and like you know Dexton posts a video and it gets 500k views and he lied about the height of the rim like the entire time. Well, now if Isaiah goes and dunks on 11 feet, which is realistic for him to do and would be very difficult or 12, 11, six or something like that. I would that. say even on 11 foot rim, like that's, that's tough. That's crazy, like. yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> or Dan posts on 10, five or something like that. And everyone's like, Dexton did it on 12. And then you get a million little kids that see that. You're like, well, yeah, but it's just a bunch of little kids, who cares? Well, guess what? Those hundreds of thousands or millions of little kids that watch Dexton's video, YouTube doesn't yeah. care that they're that they're 13 years old it still pays him out according to how and that's what sucks gets. it's like and people don't watch isaiah's video now because yeah. those little kids don't watch isaiah's video because they think what dexton that's says. true that's what sucks it's like if dexton by doing that and by being dishonest or immoral or whatever you want to call it unethical un say. unethical <laughs> yeah. by being unethical he's getting he's reaping a lot of benefits from that he's reaping he's getting the mass of the basketball dunk audience on his page and that's taken away from everybody right exactly versus it, it's just it's, it, it comes down to it's like a selfishness like slash greed thing it is a, it is yeah and like we might dunk with dexon at some point and like we're probably not gonna bring this i don't know maybe as well i don't know we'll probably joke about it like we, we tend to like poke fun at things we think are stupid like shout out who makes tape uh like it's just like funny you know we'll probably we'll probably be like yeah dexon like how high is that who like 13 14 feet I don't know. Like, little bullying never hurt nobody. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Bullying's terrible. Don't bully. Uh, I was bullied. But, no, I think it's uh, it's just one of those things where, like, it, it does impact us. And, like, that's why yeah. it, it does piss us off sometimes. So Same with the – and then to go with the, the coaching thing, like – and this is for anything. Like, the most ethical thing you can do is just be good. And, and just, that's what sells your product. Which is, like, what – that, that's what we kind of pride ourselves in. And, like, and, like with THP strength is, like – we our marketing is literally our our results like yeah. how how good how good we can get like in terms of vertical like need all that stuff like that's what that's what we focus on it's just, it's just being better like mm -hmm. um i would say our marketing is really ass like it's actually quite bad yeah uh, <laughs> if you were to if you were to compare us to other people we're we're not very good at marketing we don't do because it it's not a job. priority for us no, our not. priority is literally like it's learn as much learn as <laughs> yeah. much as possible um train as hard as possible and then just be good coaches, give yeah. give people give people results and all that stuff. So it's it's like I think that's why, and this is something I, I didn't understand before is like that's why John got gets so mad when there's other coaches when he beefs with other coaches and stuff like that. It's because he John's trying to be the best coach and he sees stuff that isn't backed by research and all that stuff. And then yeah, like, I mean from my perspective, you have to understand like I have a science based background and an experience based background, yeah. and when someone just like Hop. And I mean, other older coaches feel the same way about me on this, but like they also don't know what I've done and stuff like that a lot of time. If you're listening to this, you definitely do. But like, you know, I, I, I pride myself on science. Like science is a huge part of my life and I studied nonstop. Like every day I'm gonna be watching videos and looking at the science behind it, not just looking at it like, oh, that's cool. Like I'm actually breaking down joint angles, joint velocities, 
what their hips are doing, what, what their pelvis is doing. I'm looking at things that other people aren't looking at and analyzing that. And so when, when someone comes in and they, they say something completely contrarian, even just from like a basic, very basic freshman year anatomy class, they like something that is just false, you know, it would be like someone does a squat and they're like, oh yeah, you're, this is an ab exercise. Or like yeah. someone does a bicep curl and they're like, it really hits your triceps. Like there's a, there's a, there's a coach right now that is like doing things that are basically that they're saying that an exercise is working a muscle that it doesn't. And that like, to me, I'm like, what? I'm like, how can you just fly in the face of something that is objectively true? We've observed with EMG evidence. Like you're just saying it's something that's false, you know, like that makes me really upset, yeah. you know? And then to see that this person is going to profit more from that because they, can make a, they just say that they're the best or they guarantee something that is impossible to guarantee. Like that makes me mad, you know? And, and that's sometimes why I do get upset. So yeah, uh, I think it is personal. It's personal. Yeah. <laughs> You're messing with my life, my well, lifestyle. What, what I like about what we're doing though, is like, because we're, we're science and research based and because we know what we're doing and like all that stuff, you, you attract similar, similar types of people. Yeah. Like yeah, let's say, um, Nick Briz, I don't Nick Briz probably not gonna watch this. <laughs> Nick, Nick Briz is selling a jump program for ten dollars, and it's like stair running, basically. Yeah, like, it's like bleachers. My my brother, my little brother, made a subreddit on pro dunking, and like they they just bagged on his program on there. Yeah. Um. But what what type of people is that program attracting? It's literally attracting twelve and thirteen year olds. People who, that are never gonna buy. Our who don't program. who don't know <laughs> who don't know about jump training and stuff like that. The people the kind of people we attract, I would say, is somebody who. Is highly educated. has done their research yeah. on, on jump training who's gone through years of reading through research uh doing all the different jump programs learning about their body and stuff like that and they see that we can add value to that right yeah. we yeah. add value to the training me i was i was pro pro dunker really freaking good all that stuff um there was even times after you started coaching me that i that i stopped like i was like john like i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'm gonna do my own thing like i'm yeah. trying to coach myself and all that stuff but john added value right he added value that i couldn't find anywhere else i can't uh it's really t i i would argue that everybody needs a coach that's something that's, that's i don't I mean, care i have a coach <laughs> I don't, yeah I, I would argue no, it doesn't matter no, it doesn't matter how elite of a dunker you are how smart of a coach you are i feel like everybody needs a coach and that's something i used to not know like yeah you like just coming up above it, like until I, I got coached for a couple years consistently and it's nice and then, yeah it's really nice you make a lot more progress <laughs> it's and it's good from what we were talking about from a stress standpoint too it's it's i would that's a big stress is like having to worry about your own training having to deal with your own injuries like when you get hurt and you and you you don't have anybody to like talk to about it that's like really tough yeah. um, like like if i like if i hurt my achilles or something like that to go to to be able to go to matt and be like hey matt like my achilles is bothering me i need to do x y and z like are you okay with this or whatever and he's like he's a good coach so he knows that i'm not just telling him this to tell him this and he's gonna work with me to make that better like that that's a massive stress on my body a big part of getting a coach is getting a good coach like getting someone that long term is gonna invest in you and make you better like if Isaiah came to me and I didn't do my job, I didn't make him better, and I didn't know how to hand out, handle literally every injury he's ever dealt with, like, he would not trust me. I would not add value to what he's doing. So, like, if he pulls his hamstring, if he hurts his tibialis posterior, if he hurts... What injuries? Hold up. Let's make a list. All right. Knee. This little tendinopathy. Dealt with that. Yeah. Quad. Pulled my quad. There was time, I don't know if you remember this, but I uh, pulled my groin. There was one time I, I don't remember sprint, that one. <laughs> but I pulled my groin. <laughs> John doesn't even remember. Right, he helped me with it. Injuries, yeah. <laughs> there is the groin. Uh, I've had probably like shin splints like like a couple a couple months yeah. ago, right before before Australia. Quad tendinopathy, like and all that stuff. Like I think I think a big part of it is like people. I oftentimes will look and say well, why does, why, why jump? Why this? And it's like, well, yeah. because I don't like, there's no, there's no part of my game that you can, you're, you're going to beat me at. Like I try to know everything about everything. And like, if you're going to if you're going to come to me with a muscle injury, well, I know all the research on muscle injuries and I can apply the basic science to something very specific. That's what makes a good coach really good is being able to say, oh, I know how to deal with patella tendons, but how do I deal with the Achilles? Well, how do I deal with the hamstring tendon? How do I deal with the the elbow tendon or whatever? Yeah. Well, they're all tendons. They're all different tendons, and they all have different considerations. 
It's knowing what those considerations are and knowing how tendons work. Yeah. Same thing with muscles. It's knowing what muscles do and how also, they work and stuff like that. I want to I wanna make a point. This is something that is kind of a, a pet peeve of mine. I don't think it's possible to be truly elite and perfectly healthy. Cause I was I was thinking about like I listing know, I don't know a single person. Cause I was thinking about all the like just now when I was listing all the injuries and then I was like, damn, what what could that say about our training? Like I'm over here like getting hurt, <laughs> hurt a lot of stuff. Like I'm like, but I'm I'm thinking about it and like like John John just said, there is not. And there's people lying about this. Yeah. There is not a single person that has a high forties inch vert. I'm talking I'm not talking a there I'm not talking like a 40 inch vert that I don't consider, I, I don't consider like a 40 ish, like max elite. approach no, vert elite in, in, in any not, sense not of the world. You're like, good. if you're I had, like decent. if in I, our, in our cohort, you're not, you're good. You're not great. <laughs> if I can say, if I had a 42 inch vert, I would never get hurt. <laughs> yeah. Like ever. Like I'd be, I'd be healthy as shit. Like and our people with a 42 inch vert still get hurt. Like yeah. at this point, I'm if, talking, if Isaiah only jump 40 inches a day. Like, like it would, he just, it's, it's fine. He's not going to get hurt. Doing yeah, it. that's what I've been doing, actually. Yeah, it's pretty And I'm at my healthiest. Yeah, his standing vert is 30. I've been, dunking, I've been dunking off the dribble and only doing standing, like, max verts, and I'm very healthy. The only thing is um, when I sprain my ankle, I'm dealing with that. That it, I had a really bad ankle sprain. And because of that, I haven't been able to jump max <laughs> effort. I've been around, the like, the 40 high 30s range. So healthy. Like, my knees feel amazing, it's right? Nice. It's quite nice. Yeah, <laughs> and I could... I, I'm not gonna go down that road, but <laughs> I was gonna don't, say, don't. <laughs> but I don't think you can be truly elite and be perfectly healthy. And I would love for someone to prove me wrong. I don't think you're gonna prove me wrong. Yeah, because I would, every, I would bet my life savings that you're not gonna, yeah, that you're yeah, gonna prove and, me wrong. And I, I, if you were like, well, I've never been hurt. Well, you're 18 years old. Uh, yeah, Jordan Kogannon didn't didn't get hurt. <laughs> Guy jumped his whole career, uh, a lot of his career. Um, they didn't really deal with injuries. Also, a lot of these people, I feel like. Uh, they hide injuries. Yeah, they, would hide they don't injuries. say they, they get hurt. Um, guys like T Dub, those guys, those guys usually have a period of like, like two, like two years on the bottom end, and then maybe like five to six years on the high end of like peak performance. Yeah. Then all those guys it starts going, it starts going downhill. Jordan's been dealing with a lot of injuries. I know Guy when I was when I was with him in Australia, he was rubbing his quad tendon. And yeah. saying saying that he doesn't really know about knee pain, he was saying it was like a muscle thing. No, nah, he was rubbing his pot then. Yeah, <laughs> oh, all these people, Nick Briz, he pulls muscles all the time. Like, it, yeah, it's really tough. And then and then look at every pro athlete who ever existed. Yeah, and look at their their. And, that, and, and what's funny is like these people that are indestructible <laughs> that could go a lot of their career without getting hurt, like. You know, a lot of the time they're just very careful. They're not going to push if they're sore they're not, and they're very genetically gifted, but eventually they get hurt. And sometimes what ends their career is that they never had an injury. So they don't know how to deal with an injury yeah. and then they don't know how to get over it. And they just never jump again. And then when they go back to jumping, finally, they either get hurt again yeah. or they don't, or they just don't jump as high. And so they just quit. I actually, I would, I, I would bet that's how T-Dub and Golden Child like stopped. Yeah. They just got hurt and they were like, well. Or they tried coming back, but they were older and like, exactly. like their they body didn't have balance, and they're like, "Well, this is boring now." And yeah, no, or like got hurt and we're, couldn't. Keep oh training. yeah, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna hurt again. Oh, um, I also kind of want to adjust what I said a little bit. I think it could be possible, but it would literally have to be the most like smart training. Po like it would have to be like three max approach jumps per day you would have you'd have to n have no st physiological stress yeah. from anything in your life you would, would have it to would literally be as close as possible to you living here and us like last week last week is like i would say was so dialed in and this week and the other thing is you really can't push we're pushing really hard so like like isaiah right now it's like he already has pre-existing injuries so like his health is actually improving while he's while he's here he's not getting more beat up we go yeah, into yeah. season when we're in season, when he's in season, he's dunking all the time. That's when I'm getting hurt. That's when he's getting hurt. And I'm not able to train consistently. Yeah, you can't train. Like, I don't want, I don't want to make this seem like I'm over here, like, <laughs> yeah. like training with John and I'm like, John, I, I died. No, I'm getting hurt, hurt when and he's doing things that aren't in the plan. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm dunking for two hours when I was supposed to, to do 15 jumps. I had a Australia competition. And dunks every day. <laughs> yeah. Or freaking max out in the weight room when I wasn't supposed to max out. Yeah. Like it's, and it's that type of thing. Cause I I don't think it's possible for someone to have perfect discipline with those things either. Oh yeah, no, it's. Um, I messed up my like crossover lunch. Yeah. So don't don't get me wrong. I think it's possible. 
if things were perfect and things are never perfect yeah yeah and that's that's just the nature even of being bro human. even and wanting to be better like no one who wants to be great is going to be content doing maintaining maintain, or not pushing as hard as they can yeah like what makes us good what makes me fast in a sprint or as they jump really high or me jump high off one foot is wanting to be great if wanting to push ourselves that's when you get hurt you don't get hurt when you're at 2000 rpms you get hurt when you're redlining and yeah. like that's gonna happen more than it's supposed to when you're being competitive. So like, you know, that's a part of it too. But the other thing is like, we mitigate that a lot, like way more than other people. I know Isaiah is at risk when he sprints. So what do I do? I put on a lot of eccentric stuff for his hamstrings because that's gonna truly overload his eccentric work because that's gonna elongate the fast. Those damn that, single leg RDLs, yeah, man. But those aren't even super maximal eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> Nordics, the correct way. Um, so like those, those things are, and like, you know, being able to understand, I mean, part of me coaching him was learning those things, like knowing, hey, look, he's gonna have back pain if I deadlift with him. So we're not gonna deadlift. I'd rather do power cleans because I get more bang for my buck out of power cleans and I'd rather back squat. And if I deadlift, then I'm not gonna be able to back squat. And back squatting is more important for him than deadlift. What's funny is like through me doing power cleans and clean pulls, anytime I have that random day where I'm not supposed to see how much I can deadlift, but I do anyways, <laughs> Yeah, it's I, my more. deadlift goes up. <laughs> it's always more. It's always like, what? So like, as we push, yeah, as we push along his power clean, like I think Isaiah will probably get close to power clean 300 in his lifetime or over 300 in his lifetime. I mean, Three, if, I can, if I can power clean 315 in my life, I'll be very happy. Yeah, your quads oh. are gonna be like this big. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I don't think that those, those things are unrealistic for him to do, so. Or, uh, yeah, I don't know. That kind of goes into the injury thing. We didn't even really talk about the intent thing. And I think we're at 41 minutes. So we'll we'll try to uh, talk about how intent has impacted fatigue. Because that's really what we've been talking about. Fatigue, injury, CNS, your brain. All those things are tied to I Honestly, I might title this, this podcast, uh, can, you, can, you ha can You Be Elite and Pain Free at the same time? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if, I don't really know if it could, but yeah. the one thing I did want to say about CNS fatigue, because I don't know if we really finished this, is our experiences with it. And like this week, him training with me and pushing probably harder than he ever has in his entire life. Like the first week we got to Thursday and even me who is well trained, I've been training this hard since I was like 16, but I haven't done it recently in the last two years because I tore my labrum, hurt my patella, learning how to speed jump, shout out speed jumping. I would swear and say a few speed jumping, but I love it. Um, so like, this is the hardest I've pushed in a very long time. And uh, I can tell you from experience that like, I got to Thursday, I mean, I felt like a zombie. I literally just wanted to sleep and lay down and be like a like vegetative because I was just so out of it. <laughs> like, just like, just drained, emotionally and physically drained. And it was- It's funny. We like, trained so hard. We trained three to four hours every single day. Yeah. But there was one the Wednesday Olympics. session, we we trained for four hours. We started at two and finished at six, 6.15. And like, that's like from the time that we probably prepped for that at 1.30 till the time that we were drinking our protein shakes, it was 1.30 to 6.30. Yeah. And just the amount of time, like, yeah, we could get the whole session done if we didn't have any rest. But like, we want high quality that whole session. Like, it's hard to get the highest quality, sharpest reps possible for four hours straight. Like, that's super difficult. That's why today, we're not gonna do a full warm up today. We're gonna go outside, get our get our stuff done in 30 minutes and be done. Like that's it. <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I mean, he, Isaiah, you went from experience, dude. He was tripping over things. He couldn't find words. He was forgetting where things were. He was like, it looked like he straight up was getting dementia. Like he couldn't remember things. It was like when he'd lay there, he would just be in another world. Like I kind of have the same problem. Like Thursday, we just like sat there and played video games like zombies and just like stayed off our legs because we were sore. Our brains just yeah. said we, we my eyes were literally push. like this. Like I was like <laughs> like that the whole day. And after after Tuesday, we were basically already there. We got to Wednesday and it was just like that Monday session we pushed so hard from and I think he's traveled to played into this, but we just like wanted to train. We were excited to train. So like the effort was just crazy high. And like this week, you know, you watch the YouTube videos, there's a decrease in energy, which is fine. But guess what? It's this I would say like today, Tuesday, today. I feel worse than I did last Monday, obviously, but I feel better than I did on Thursday last week, yeah. you know? So like, I'm still bouncing back. I'm still recovering. We'll see how I feel this Thursday. Um, but yeah, I think when you're, when you're just looking at CNS fatigue, it's like a really hard thing to measure. So it's the little things, you know, and you'll hear the best track coaches in the world say, watch the warm up. You want to see how fatigued someone is, talk to them, watch the warm up. Like living with someone, you really, really get a sense of how fatigued they are. 
I was able to drop off training on Thursday. We came back on Friday and like still fatigued, but way better than like we intended to train on Thursday. We were so fatigued and so demotivated from how hard we trained early in the week that we, we couldn't even do it. We were just like, no, we're not doing this. We don't want to do this. We're tired. Our brains are dead, brain dead. That's the only way I can describe how you feel. You feel brain dead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, living with him, you really firsthand can observe like how fatigued he is and how this plays back to intent. What is intent even? We haven't really discussed this. Intent is, it, it is how hard you're pushing on anything you're doing. Like the reason I like Dragon Ball Z is because intent is a hundred million percent. You're trying as hard as you possibly can, right? And, and like Goku's like, I'm going to beat this dude's ass. He's going to ascend to a level of effort that he's never ascended to. You go Super Saiyan the video right now. I don't get a million views. <laughs> don't show everyone that. We're waiting. Um, but no, like if you, uh, the the level, it's effort. It's how hard you're trying. And if like, if you're doing a power clean and you're trying as hard as you can and your technique is good or you're sprinting, you're trying as hard as you can or you're jumping, you're trying as hard as you can and you're telling yourself jump harder, push harder, run harder. You're like, I know what that feels like. Shout out Steven Sully. Push harder, <laughs> jump harder. Yeah. Um, you just like, the effort's higher. Your CNS drive is way higher. Your intent is way higher. And if you can strategically plan that into sessions, you know a power clean is going to be max intent. You can't get it on your shoulders if it's not. You know a jump's going to be close to max intent. You know a sprint's going to be close to max intent. Squats, though, squats don't have to be max intent. So, like, Isaiah's last two sets, they're not deep squats. I call them power squats because his power output, he's trying to get as high as possible power output on that. He's trying to move the weight as hard as he can, as fast as he can. That roasts your brain. It takes the egg. It makes the pan as hot as possible, and then you just drop an egg into it, and this egg just sizzles or just bursts into flames. That's basically what max intense squats do. Your CNS drive is just so freaking Go high. Go on my Instagram and look at my, my last squat post to see what we're talking about. I'm, yeah. I'm literally driving up. It's 318, and I'm my focus is literally drive it up as hard as humanly possible. I'm trying mm -hmm. to jump. And, and why that's important is because we see that if you're intent, there's a study by Mike Stone. If your intent is as hard as possible, if someone says, push, 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 push. Every rep of every squat, of every power clean, of every sprint, if you're able to do that, you'll increase the volume, the cross-sectional area of type 2 fibers relative to type 1 fibers, which means, yeah, you can't increase the number. But if I have in this hand, I have five type 2 fibers, and in this hand, I have uh, two slow twitch fibers, well, I can't make 10 fast twitch fibers, and I can't make you know, one slow twitch fiber. But what I can do is I can make this whole, each finger bigger, and I can make each of these smaller. And that's really what you're doing. You're increasing the volume, the cross-sectional area, the size of those type two fibers. And so now the ratio, the whole size of my type two fibers is much bigger than the size of my type one fibers. So if you look at a ratio, you put them, you know, on a, you, you took your type two fibers, mushed them together, put them on a scale, took your type one fibers, mushed them together, put them on a, on a scale. There's more type two mass than there is type one mass. And that's gonna mean that you're gonna be more explosive. So that's why intent is so important. And we know that, that how's that playing with the nervous system? Well, when you drive up hard, you have alpha motor units. Alpha motor units are the big ones that recruit big muscles. And if you have a lot of alpha motor units, then that means you're gonna have, a, those recruit type two fibers. So when you drive up hard, you recruit alpha motor units. And when you're able to innervate the alpha motor units, they're gonna innervate the type two fibers. So now your alpha motor units are a max central drive, max neural drive. And now your type two fibers are preferentially being recruited because you're telling yourself push harder. Well, the type one fibers are not, they're being recruited, but maybe not to the extent that the type two fibers are. So now these get hypertrophy, they get bigger and bigger. And the type two fibers, even if they stay the same size, or even they, maybe they get a little smaller, maybe they get a little bigger, but they don't get as big as fast as the type two fibers are you're gonna be more explosive coming out of that. So the, the downside is again, is the fatigue. A lot of people, that's why they love velocity-based training. Have you ever heard of that? That's why people love velocity-based training. But if you're if you're gonna push intent super hard, there's a cost. There is a, there is a, a penalty, a tax that must be paid because you decided to push as hard as you possibly could. Isaiah has observed that firsthand in his standing jumps. Like his standing jumps, his vertical is plummeting this week. Why? Because he's training harder. He's pushing intent on those squats. You might say, well, why would you do that? Don't you want to jump high? Why not just jump all the time? Okay, there's a time and place for everything. There's a time where we don't want to focus only on jumping because how are you going to get better at jumping if you don't have more reserve? You need more physiological reserve. You need more type 2 fibers to jump higher eventually. You need more cross-sectional area. You need more neural drive. That's why people plateau from jumping every day, jumping all the time. Or they maybe sometimes get worse. <laughs> like, yeah. You might have one outlier day and then you're progressively going down. I think that's kind of what happened with CJ and why he's starting to finally jump back up is 
is train Manani. You can't get better if all you do is jump. You just, I mean, yeah, it's really important, but like if you're trying to break through, you're going to get to a point where like it's diminishing returns. Jumping doesn't pay back because jumping, in, in, it intensifies as you get better. So the better you get, the better the plyos are by jumping because you're jumping harder and jumping harder means you're training harder and training harder means you're going to adapt better because you're training harder because you're jumping higher and you're falling from a higher distance. So now it's like, okay, well, yeah, you'll get good. You'll get really good doing that. At a certain point though, now you need something more to tap into, right? Your coordination is maxed out. Your tendons are as stiff as they're going to get doing that. Or maybe you get hurt or something like that. And then it's like, as a two foot jumper, that's a really important part is having a lot of big, strong type two fibers. If you look at Isaiah's quads, they're big as shit relative to mine. Like my legs are not, my quads are not very big. He's got a lot of type two mass in his quads. His, um, you know, and like his hamstrings, his hips, like his freaking glutes, you can tell there's a lot of type two mass there. Um, you know, dummy thick. he dummy thick as he starts to, hit. And, and if you look at his acceleration, guess where he's going to beat me accelerating because, or if you look at his spring, you look at, he's going to beat me in acceleration because he's really explosive, really, really explosive from a standstill. You give him another step, he gets even more explosive as he gets more coordinated. He's going to get even better at accelerating, um, at upright tends to favor me a little bit more because I'm a little bit more elastic. My Achilles is a little bit stiffer. Um, and I'm, I've been doing it longer. I'm more coordinated at, at, in that activity. I can, I've been running fast since I was a little kid. Um, especially upright running. I always thought I was better at upright running as a little kid. I was always like, yeah, I started, I suck at starting, but once I get upright, I just hit another gear. That's always what I used to say. Um, but he'll continue to get better at that. So yeah, you know, you look at, uh, how this all plays a role, how it all ties in again, comes back to fatigue and understanding how do you, how do you mitigate fatigue? How do you, how do you use fatigue to your advantage and not necessarily look at it as a bad thing? Like a lot of people are like, my vertical went down. This isn't working. No, it's just, it's your, you're training hard, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, and, and you'll bounce back, but it's gonna, you're gonna have to be smart about how you do that. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to say about intent and CNS fatigue. And I think that's a good place to, yeah, good place to 51 minutes. Yeah. That's not too long. We did good. Man. We don't get too distracted. We did get distracted. <laughs> uh, so yeah, make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow us uh on instagram on Tran transistor subscribe to the channel on apple apple music or wait what is it apple yeah, podcast apple podcast spotify make sure you go to the youtube like it comment anything else i'm missing nope that's pretty much it <laughs> we're we're gonna be uh doing podcasts every tuesday and thursday if we miss a day get on our asses dm us to be like why was yeah. there not a podcast episode this is the today on Thursday. we'll call this bedside chat episode one <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but yeah guys uh thanks for listening it goes that five star review tag us on your stories and we'll catch you guys on thursday for episode 34 peace Take it easy